Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for uh, your very kind invitation. Thank you, Katrine, um, for the invitation. Um, um, and namaste. Um, you know, pleased to have the opportunity to be here and um, not only within the context of the work of the foundation, but within the context of this set of um, discussions and research that you've inaugurated. I think, um, you know, given the times in which we live and um, a time that somehow might inspire despair in many of us, but in, to which we must not succumb. Um, it seems to me essential that all formations of knowledge, whatever they may be, must be the opportunity to create these ruptures um, on edifices that refuse to give, especially you know, structures of knowledge that oftentimes refuse the, any attempt to admit you know, forms of thought, be it literary, artistic, you know, social and so on, into the very ungiven broad edifice of the West. So I'm very, very pleased that um, the idea of modernities in, in the plural um, will be the context in which I'm going to speak this evening. Um, and nevertheless, um, you know, given the, you know, the kind of the, the, the nuclear attack <laughs> we had on Tuesday, um, you know, where can one sort of find shelter from the, you know, radiation fallout of this election? Um, so it seems then, you know, to me that beginning um, I want to talk about an exhibition that just opened in Munich uh, several weeks ago, um, post-war art between the Pacific and Atlantic, 1945 to 1965. Um, the stress, obviously, is in this parenthetical area of the two bodies of water, the Pacific and Atlantic, in which, you know, we move from north to south and east to west in order to traverse, if you will, the geography of artistic experience and artistic production and the links between artists. And even when there are no specific links between them, but the fact you know, that there is a historical record if you will, of different contexts of production. So I thought I should begin, um, because maybe the occasion calls for it, um, with a reflection on why post-war. And in his posthumously published prison notebooks, Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist philosopher, writing during the depths of his incarceration by the fascist government of Benito Mussolini in the 1930s, made the following observation. I think it's an observation what many of us know, but it's, it bears repeating. That the challenge of modernity is to live without illusions and without becoming disillusioned. So despite Trump, we must not become disillusioned. I am a pessimist because of intelligence, but an optimist because of will. Gramsci's reflection on modernity is all the more captivating as it anticipated so succinctly the dire spirit and wretched state engendered by the catastrophe of World War II across the world. For many who survived the war, especially those who witnessed the concentration camps and the atomic bombs. 
saw the respective images of destroyed lives and cities and lived through the social conditions of the period. To not become disillusioned required extraordinary vigilance. Even before the war ended, the prescient incisiveness with which Gramsci confronted modernity's positivistic idealism had united many modern artists, thinkers, policymakers, legal theorists, and ordinary people around a singular fact. The necessity to emerge from the trauma and unprecedented violence of World War II without illusions, particularly at a time when humanity faced the daunting task to not become disillusioned while building an entirely new modern and humanistic compact. The post-war period inspired a profound reflection on how to assimilate the lessons of the war in Europe and Japan especially, together with the invidious statecraft of colonialism, while also recognizing without equivocation the question among the colonized for the end of colonial empires and imperial dominions. Both victors and vanquished of the war had to live up to new responsibilities by instituting programs and policies that would ensure a smooth transition from the bellicose era to a more peaceful period. It is in this sense that the understanding of post-war within the remit of the exhibition that we've just opened should, be, should not be seen as purely an aftermath, but as a horizon into which the ideals of global emancipation and decolonization could be projected as the new world order transitioned into a multilateral system of governance. So what I want to sort of to, you know, to talk about is perhaps how can the connection between art and social history be made. So when we began this project several years ago, it was going to be a series or it, you know, a series of exhibitions over an eight-year period. So it was a research project, just as you're inaugurating here. And post-war is the first uh, uh, iteration of the, of the trilogy of exhibitions. The, the second one, which will be in 2019, um, is called Post-Colonialism, 1950 to 1980. And we don't quite have a subtitle yet, but it will focus primarily on emancipatory acts connected to post-colonialism. And now, what we want to do in this exhibition is to explore the dimension of the post-colonial from two perspectives. The first perspective, obviously, is related to the way art and artists confronted the dissolution of colonial empires. So, Y55 to 1980. So we look at the trajectory of the first Asia-Africa conference in Bandung in 1955 organized by Sukano. Then the 1961 conference, non-aligned conference in Belgrade. And then in 1966, a tricontinental conference in Havana. But we also want to make a distinction between this particular view of the post-colonial with a new horizon of decolonization that emerged in from the 60s onwards. And this will be um, the confrontation with empire. In this sense, the colossus of the United States and the Soviet Union. And the emergence, if you will, of radical extreme left movements but also movements within national context.
to resist, if you will, um, you know, structures of authoritarian rule, the territorialization of dictatorships in various na national, national systems. So, and the response to that, um, both in the social context, so we sort of have to recover, um, you know, the, the, you know those, that, that period of resistance, whether by looking at work inspired by extreme left groups from the Red, Red, Red Army of Japan, the Red Brigade, you know, the Red Army faction, and of course others in different parts of the world, and so on. So that's the second, you know, part of the show, post-colonial. The, the end of it in 1980 is the Iranian Revolution of 79, and the first state of emergency of the apartheid state in 1980 by Botha, and to look at the way art, artists, filmmakers, and so on responded to that. So the third part of the trilogy, we don't quite have a date since our building will be closed beginning at the end of 19 for renovation. We will see how it goes. Uh, it's called post-communism. So all of these projects are somehow linked with the history of Hausekunst and Germany, so the division of Germany. So anyway, let me go back to post-war. What I'm going to show very quickly is just some installation views. I'm going to show a lot of slides, uh, so please bear with me, and I'm going to be as fast as possible. Stop me, if you will. So this is kind of the entry hall of our space. May, you know, some of you might know that this building was you know, opened in 1937, was constructed by Hitler and was where the first um, Große Deutsche Kunstausstellung was held um, in July uh, 1937. The day after this exhibition opened um, was the inauguration of the Degenerate Art Exhibition. So in a sense, the inauguration of this building also represented the expulsion of all that was experimental, all that was you know, um, non-conformist in modern art. So uh, our building and its legacy is a very conflicted one. So anyway, so I'm just going to, you know, go through. This is the work of David Medalla, um, a, a Filipino artist who uh, migrated to, emigrated to London in the uh, early 1960s and so on, but I will come to all of that. Just to, I'm just showing some installation shots, and of course, uh, this work by Atsuko Tanaka, um, you know, from the first Gutai exhibition in 1955, and the first room of our exhibition with Joseph Boyce's um, Monuments to the Stag, and just behind it. So by the way, the exhibition is in eight chapters in eight sections. The first section um, is called Aftermath, Zero Hour and the Atomic Era. And what we wanted to do was to, is, um, was to explore the way that artists responded to the end of the Second World War. What kind of art was made, by whom, and, um, and to do so, uh, um, uh, we wanted to sort of to link you know, Germany and Japan. So to look at um, the, the, the post-war period in terms of the Holocaust and in terms of the atomic bombs. So, uh, so the room um, the behind you know, the gentleman, the, the large canvas to the right um, is um, a painting by Frank Stella from 1958 about Mark Fry which many of you might know, you know as an inscription um, in, into the entrances of many concentration camps during this period. Stella made a second work uh, within this series of paintings called you know, Die Fahne Hoch, which is a raise high the banner, which was kind of you know, a mantra of um, you know, certain you know, groups during this period. 
to the left of that, those two paintings, uh, the first um, you know, painting, well, both paintings are by Maurice Lewis. Um, you know, the, the, the first painting is Jewish Star, and the second is, you know, is from the series um, Chart Journals, you know, fire written, so, which is a reference to the burning of the books um, and so on, uh, you know, during the, um, the pogroms in, 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 um, that took place in, in, in Berlin, the so-called Crystal Night. Uh, so it's a reference to it and, you know, the work of Wolf Ostel. And uh, anyway, I'm going to come to that. And they, immediately in this, the room, you know, so when you stand into this room, you will look into this room. So there's a kind of sense of this landscape of ruin. Um, it may seem bleak uh, in, its out, in its outlook, but, but it was precisely, you know, the attempt to recover the sense of the catastrophe itself that, that artists engaged, that we wanted to sort of to, to, you know, to probe into. So the second room concerns Japan, the, um, the, um, the detonation of the two bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and the responses by artists, of course, Henry Moore's Art on Peace in the, in the, in the foreground, you know, to the left, the painting by Carol Apple, Hiroshima Child. And the two large panels comes from this 15 panel work, you know, done by the um, Japanese couple Maruki Iri and Maruki Toshi called the Hiroshima Panels. After the American occupation of Japan, the images of the destruction of the atomic bombs were prescribed, meaning they could not be shown, they could not be published. So, um, so the idea that we could move from, the, on the one hand, this sense in Germany that the, the Holocaust was unrepresentable to the enforced attempt to not to represent or to show the destruction of the, of, of the atomic bomb was something that was very interesting to to, uh, to think about in relation to the work made by the couple. So they made this series of panels which they traveled through Japan. So the, the, you know, the, 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 the panel on the top um, is the second of the 15 panels, the one, and it's called Fire. And the second one is the sixth in the series. Um, and it's called Atomic Desert, both of them. Um, from 1950, and they toured these panels, you know, through the um, through the, um, the country to sort of to represent this. In any case, I'm just going to go very quickly, and then I'm going to go through the chapters. The the, the goal of the exhibition, um, essentially for us, was to really to look at globally what did artists make and where and and with what. Uh, so on the, on the one hand, there's a kind of social history dimension to the construction of the exhibition. On the other, it was also sort of looking at the territory of art. So the, the second um, section is called Form Matters, and, um, and, and I will come when I go through each chapter you know, very quickly, but I just wanted to show you know, the work of you know, Giuseppe Pino Galizio, um, and, and then next to it is the work for Sia Majani um, called Prayer, and it's almost like an abstract work, but it's, it's a work of very fine, delicate calligraphy um, that fills you know, this space, uh, the space of the, of the work. And, and I will come back to the question of calligraphy in, in relation to cosmopolitanism, which is a different section of the show. And of course, behind that is the work of Lee Krasner. I'm just showing installation views and um, you know, the territory of artists, of course, you know, Du Buffet and Maria Lasnik and um, um, Smell Fata from Syria. And this room, which um, looks a bit crowded, but I think it's, uh, <laughs> um, so I, I have to 
thank Catherine for the gift you know, she made by lending us you know, three extraordinary works um, in the show uh, in which we brought together you know, works by, of course, Giacometti, Picasso, Korea, the massacre in Korea. A painting that was last shown in, in Hausekunst in 1955 on the occasion of Picasso's retrospective in the building. Um, in a sense, the return of, of the avant-garde of, of modernism back into the building with Guernica also presented and the entire series of women of Algiers, which had just been completed in 1954. It was the first time that the entire series of women of Algiers was presented. And, uh, and of course, you know, the work by Ibrahim El Salahi, you know, just next to Picasso, and the painting by the young Onkawara from 1953. Uh, it was 20 when he made that work. Um, the work of Magbu Fida Hussein, an Indian artist, and of course Francis Bacon um, um, in, in the room. And um, I love this particular image because I didn't realize until the work was installed that this was the image on the cover of Museum of Modern Art's New Images of Man exhibition from 19. Um, 59, and not the bronze, but the plaster. I didn't, you know, it was, um, I was very, um, you, know, um, you, know, you know, stunned to, 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 to see that, you know, the, the sort of the career of this particular, you know, sculpture and uh, in relation to that exhibition. Uh, but, you know, I'm just going to go through the, you know, so here's the third section. Uh, well, the, the second section, this section, in fact, sorry, is it, known as New Images of Man. So we're looking at various registers of the, you know, the relationship between existentialism and humanism in this show. So there are several galleries for that, you know. But, and here, you know, uh, we're looking at realisms, you know, from different parts of the world, the reproduction of Siqueiros' mural in Mexico, um, with the you know, Russian work, and the section on cosmopolitanism. Um, so the work of Alexander Skunda Bogosian, who began his career as an artist here in Paris and so in the late 50s, early 60s. He's a, a, an Ethiopian artist of Armenian descent, and then, you know, then later on moved to the United States. This, you know, group of works, um, you know, were made, in fact, here in Paris before he moved to the United States to teach at Harvard University. Um, but, just, you know, the work of other artists, Brand Bowling, Eva Hess, um, Ivan Diaye, um, Ben and Wong from Nigeria, and, and Jacob Lawrence and Siporin, just a few, a few. You know, works made in Paris again, uh, as well Kelly, um, collages. Um, in this section, this section um, is called Concrete Visions. Um, so you can see you know, some of the... Okay, now I'm going to talk and I'm going to read. So the... So post-war um, is described here as a historical period following the end of World War II. These years were marked on the one hand by reconstruction and rehabilitation, and on the other by a fundamental program of taking stock, asking questions, and a flurry of institutional activities, the creation of new global bodies, from the United Nations to the Bretton Woods institutions. In the field of art, the post-war period marks a historical and cultural turning point, not only in Europe, but in other parts of the world, for it brought about the waning dominance of the Western European art capitals 
and the rise of the international presence, and some would argue the hegemony of contemporary American arts, popular culture, and mass media. If America liberated Western Europe, as has often been said, from the scourge of fascism and Nazism, it also liberated itself from the artistic and cultural domination of Western Europe. This shift, in fact, mirrored the altered terms of geopolitical power with defeated Europe, acquiring and acquiescing to new patrons and protectors, just as the Cold War divided the continent into two spheres of influence between the Warsaw Pact countries and Eastern and Central Europe, allied with the Soviet Union and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization countries of Western Europe, allied with the United States. The arts also created a distinct ideological relationship between communism and capitalism, between socialism and liberal democracy. A crude binary, you know, for sure, but the ideological differences in the division of the East and West did not always take into account the flow of movement between North and South or the flow of movement between South and South. So it would be a mistake then, as has often been made, to make the narrative of post-war history only the history of Europe's relationship to America, to the United States. There were many other zones and scenes of production and so the, the focus on the North Atlantic world um, you know, needs to be expanded and to be broadened and therefore to bring in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America. Uh, this was the context in which this exhibition was made. So, and it was also made against the backdrop of what one could call the art history industry of post-1945 art. So the, every survey that you open up only begins to be global when it comes to the 90s, as if the rest of this period was a cultural desert. So while it was not our task to rewrite this narrative, it was nevertheless our purpose to present a new understanding of the actors within this history and to raise substantial questions about the trajectories and genealogies of post-war art and its histories. In recent decades, a new art history has come to the fore that is neither exclusivist in its interest nor exclusionary in scholarship. New spaces of research are opening up, especially by young scholars who are now writing or working at recovering you know, works that had you know, been placed in zones of opacity for, for quite some time. So that was the reason why we wanted to sort of to make this show, to interrogate the assumption of whether it is possible to write a post-war art history that was horizontal rather than vertical. But I will take you very quickly through the, the different sections. So as I mentioned, the first section of the exhibition is an enormous show, so please bear with me. It has 218 artists from 65 countries from every imaginable continent. So I'll take you through the, the, the the show very quickly, the works that are in the show. So the, the first section, Noguchi's Humpty Dumpty. And um, um, Belt over for Hiroshima. And a series of drawings um, made um, around some of these you know, sculptures. So I'm just gonna go quickly and I, I will stop and speak uh, every so often. So these are all the works in the first section of the exhibition, Norman Lewis's Every Atom Glows. Um, so as you can see, 
we didn't want to make an exhibition of masterpieces uh, because that, you know, um, is an exhibition that you will see in um, the, the kind of mainstream narrative of post-war art. But we wanted to sort of to look at emblematic works in the careers of the artists, um, uh, you know, whom we are very yeah, interested in. And here, you know, uh, an early Bennett Newman. So the concern in this section of the exhibition um, is still the, the, the residues of the, the war you know, the, and the question of the atomic. And, and here are the series of photographs by uh, Yusuke Yamahata, a young Japanese um, military photographer who was sent to Nagasaki the day after to photograph and to document um, you know, the exhibition to this photo montage by um, the uh, Polish artist is uh, uh, documenting the war to this montage uh, of the um, mushroom cloud um, embracing, you know, the American, you know, flag. And um, works by artists such as Kim Ko Lim from Korea, uh, again, reflecting on the, um, the kind of the cosmic, you know, nature of the, uh, of the destruction. And different artists really uh, exploring this, you know, this manifestation of the, 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 the iconography of the mushroom cloud as one way to sort of to, um, you know, think um, uh, in, in this section about the aftermath. And that's the work of Enrico Bai, and another work by him with um, two other artists, you know, in this. Um, collective called Movimiento Arte Nucleare. And um, so anyway, I'm just gonna go very quickly. Because I want to show, we have a lot of, <laughs> I have a lot of images to show you because I want to run through the images and then talk a little bit about the exhibition and the research. And the, the second section of the show is divided uh, in two parts. And uh, one, is really looking at gestural abstraction. And the, 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 the second part is looking at you know, material abstraction, the way um, the, the material, the entropy, if you will, of form um, was um, a very um, you know, persistent you know, part of the production um, of art during, you know, in this period from 45 to 65. So of course, um, we were very interested in uh, showing um, not necessarily the, um, the very iconic you know, paintings by Pollock, of course, uh, but to trace um, in the exhibition, you know, uh, uh, in the, at least in the selection of this work, the, the, the genealogy of, you know, of his drip paintings and, and this particular you know, work sits at a, you know, it's a very central, you know, in a central place in the development of, of that work. And of course, um, you know, we go on to present um, the, the drip painting and Lee Krasner. Um, we wanted a work that was bigger than that of her husband. Um, And the work of you know, Pharaoh Nisa Zaid, uh, born, in, you know, born in Turkey, um, and married one of the members of the um, Jordanian you know, royal family, but was an artist who throughout the 50s and, and the late 40s, beginning here in Paris, um, sort of defied all the 
you know, assumptions of the work of female artists coming, you know, from the Middle East. Uh, the work was very bold, it was abstract, and, uh, and the scale of the work was also, um, um, you know, rare for the time, you know, working on, you know, very, you know, you know large scale. Um, you know, of course, we, you know, we wanted to, you know, present, you know, two parts of, um, you know, the Koenig's, uh, you know, work, the, the, the group of abstract works that we first presented um, in, in a show um, in 19, you know, 48, I believe it was at Becky Jackson, you know, gallery. Um, you found, um, this is an early work, this is pre Monoha, uh, you know, work. Um, again, a very, you know, rare work of, um, you know, uh, at a period when he was still, you know, young. Um, please bear with me. It's necessary to show you the, the exhibition in order to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it in the abstract. It's, you know, the, the reason being that it's, it's um, the, the nature of the research that generated the work. Um, is necessary to be contextualized in order to, um, you know, to explore. Okay, the second part of the of the of of, of this section is called ruins and refuse. So, um, like I said, uh, it's work that was concerned with material. Huh? Okay, I'm going to show. Okay, I'm not going to talk. Okay, so. And the section New Images of Man I mentioned already, and um, again, I'm going to. show some images and then talk about the rationale behind the different sections. So obviously in the New Images of Man, what we were concerned with was the different you know, states of the human form and the way um, those states were articulated in various disciplines, mostly in sculpture and in painting. And of course, there are works that sort of straddle the bridge between realism um, and, uh, and, of course, you know, and some of the uh, ideas that have been explored in this section of a more kind of visceral, anguished, you know, um, eviscerated, you know, uh, you know, human forms. And for each artist, we've, you know, tried to, um, you know, locate not only the, you know, the most emblematic works, but to, um, you know, locate um, um, works developed during the early stages of the particular language they were, uh, you know, using. And, um, it would seem in, in some of these works that it was, it should have been titled New Images of, not man, of women. So when you look at this section, what becomes very clear is a network of artists from um, a range of places on this theme that um, obviously in the MoMA exhibition um, did not consider um, how artists from different parts of the world may have uh, addressed the very na you know, nature of the, uh, of the human condition, um, whether as it applies to the specificity of the, um, of the regions or the local context, or as it may have applied in terms of the more universal um, you know, recognition of this particular question. And I, I will come a little bit to address this in relation to the work of Franz Fanon and M.S. Césaire on, 
you know, questioning and, you know, response to, uh, or if you will, their critique of a particular idea of humanism as um, uh, it was developed within post-war Western philosophy. Of course, looking at Jean-Paul Sartre, you're here, so you probably, you know, know a lot more about this. Um, and the third section, the fourth section is realisms. And here we are really very interested. This painting finally did not make it into the exhibition. One of the difficulties of an exhibition like this, um, and which you know, reminded us of you know, how the increasing impossibility of organizing exhibition of, exhibitions of this scope is just the amount of resources required to make the show. Um, we finally declined to show this painting because it was valued at 52 million. <laughs> um, you, know, you know, dollars. And, um, but we were concerned with the idea of realism, not you know, from the perspective of that binary of East and West, that the West was about abstraction, you know, the binary of the Cold War period and the East, was about socialist realism. But because realism itself was an, you know, um, yeah, an idea that it was very emblematic of you know, uh, different investigations and different concerns, or what we what, what could say socially concerned you know, you know, um, you know, artistic production from different parts of the world. So, you know, be it from the United States or from the Soviet Union or from China um, and other parts of the world. So we wanted to sort of to grapple with different turns of realism in this uh, exhibition without burdening the notion of realism with a socialist, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, lineage during this period, which was obviously um, you know, um, you know, conditioned by different ideological responses to um, to uh, artistic practice in, in in particular, you know, segments of the world. That of course the the American um, you know um, abstract artists we are projected as um, as paragons of of freedom of individualism and so on. And of course. You know the the artists working in the social so, socialist realist you know language we're seen to be artists working within the conformity of state sanctioned you know ideas about art but we we're not interested necessarily in in this cleavage between um, abstraction and realism as such but just simply to sort of to look at the way in which you know realism as such was pursued in various um, you know, contests uh, around the world. But of course, we also wanted to show very specific types of socialist realist works. So, um, and you can see some of the most terrible ones here, <laughs> but very good. <laughs> so as we shift from you know, the, the realist work from um, you know, you know, from the Soviet Union, um, you know, to places like Poland, the work of Fango, the 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 use of irony in 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 the works, you know, begin to be you know quite interesting. If, if you look very closely, the you know the figure um, on, on the left with the you know yellow sunglasses. You know, has all these inscriptions on her dress. You know, New York, Wall Street. You know, Coca Cola, London. So this, you know, this tension, you know, between the figures on the right, who, you know, this earthy, you know, you know, you know, figures representing a particular, you know, um, social ideal, and this other figure that was about to sort of to break away from from that context, and then of course, uh, Gutuzo's boogie woogie and here the insertion of uh, Mondrian's you know Broadway boogie woogie in the background uh, you know brings up again this you know very interesting uh, you know again tension between abstraction 
and, and realism uh, and foreground it um, in, a, uh, in a very you know, specific um, you know, and transparent manner. So looking at the work of artists from different parts of the world in, in the context of, you know, um, of the show, it was in a way to sort of to show the, the, um, the way that realism itself you know, was not only just simply a style, but a narrative you know, approach. Um, uh, if you look at this particular work from Egypt by Hamad uh, Awais, um, so um, we use for, as structures of, of, you know, of narration for propaganda and, and, you know, and for veneration of various um, you know, um, historical developments within <coughs> specific national contexts. And here, you know, so we go to concrete visions, which is the, the recovery of geometric abstraction, um, you know, in um, the work of artists, you know, operating uh, principally not in Europe, but uh, beginning, um, you, know, with, you know, with South America. The reason why we have Max Beal um, as, uh, as a very, you know, instrumental figure, uh, for the development of uh, concrete art uh, was based on his reception in, in South America, in Brazil specifically, um, where um, the, his, uh, his visit in the late 1940s uh, became very significant for um, you know, many artists from Brazil who subsequently you know, come to prominence in the development of of both concrete and neo concrete art. And, but we were, again, we were very interested in sort of looking at different turns of, of you know, abstraction in this context. Now, the, 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 this, the sixth you know, chapter of the exhibition um, is obviously concerned with. Um, movement, the artists leaving their countries of origin or art, you know, to study or migrating elsewhere to live. But it's also artists working within the context of their own, um, you know, specific, you know, cultures, but making connections that are fundamentally about uh, systems of communication. And I will come to this, and especially in the context of what is now called calligraphic abstraction, the way that the Arabic script um, in the work of these artists became um, a kind of cosmopolitan signature, whether used by the, the, the prevalence suddenly in the work of contemporary or modern artists in the Middle East, uh, whether it's in North Africa, um, in Iran, you know, Sudan, Egypt, um, Pakistan, uh, Turkey, you know, with, 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 with some of this, you know, these forms. So, I will come to that. So here, the work of you know, Sada Khan, um, uh, a Pakistani artist. And what you see is that we really identify where the artists were, the, the name of the place is when the artists were born. So British India, you know, 1913, of course. Yeah, you know. And here, you know, Ero Akiavas, so this idea of cosmopolitanism as an imaginary rather than as, um, a physical dislocation or movement to another part of the world. And so, uh, and here the script itself uh, is, is, you know, deployed as a tool of abstraction, not necessarily as a calligraphic, you know, um, um, uh, you know, meaning, but in a sense as um, a drive towards you know, the production of gesture. And so meaning is not necessarily 
written into the use of the script, but the script was used both as material and as, as a sign in the work. So we're very interested in, in why, you know, uh, during this period of the 50s and, and, uh, and, and, the, and the 60s, many of these artists were very, you know, concerned and persistent in the deployment of this, you know, material. Of course, you do know some, you know, there's, uh, an artist like Sia Majani, uh, who subsequently, of course, changed completely the orientation of his practice. Um, you know, you know, you know, began very early, uh, sort of in a kind of very experimental and open way um, in you know working <coughs> with um, you know different you know understandings of, of the mark. And of course, there were European artists who made the other journey, the moving from Europe to other parts of the world and. Suzanne Wenger's, you know, surgeon in Nigeria, beginning in 1949 until, um, you know, she, you know, passed away in 2009. A surgeon of, you know, um, uh, you know, you know, 50 years, um, was also very um, emblematic of the kind of cosmopolitan, um, you know, networks and exchanges um, that you know took root during the post-war period. There was not only just the flow of artists from, you know, uh, uh, from the global south to the west, but also artists moving from the west to elsewhere. Oftentimes, you know, taking on, in the case of Susan Wenger, some of the iconography of the of the places where they, you know, they settled, but also, you know, transmitting. Um, you know the 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 the, the, uh, the you know the fundamental um, you know ideas of artistic production from the West. Here was one of her students um, you know, in several workshops she ran in Nigeria during this period, uh, twin seven seven, um, uh, who is the youngest artist in the show. And Mark Toby. So artists like Frank Bolin moving from Guyana um, to you know, study in England and then of course settling there. And of course we were also interested in cosmopolitanism from the perspective of expatriation and exile and dislocation. Uh, a condition that really um, in, in, in many ways enriched um, the um, the artistic cultures of many, you know, of many parts of the world, especially European emigres and Jewish artists um, who left Europe um, in, you know, during you know, the, you know, the, the rise of, of, of fascism. And you see many of those artists in the show. Uh, artists like Gustav Metzger, born in Nuremberg and was um, one of the you know, group of children <laughs> who were shipped out of, uh, or airlifted out of Germany in the, in, the, in the 30s. And in the case of Jacob Lawrence, it was, you know, for us, it's really trying to sort of to trace um, the, the, the journeys of many African-American artists in the 50s who wanted to somehow reconnect to Africa. And, um, so there was a fund developed by the United States government through the CIA, um, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, that you know, gave grants and you know, uh, operated as, uh, as an agent, if you will, you know, connecting artists um, and intellectuals to, um, you know, in, in, uh, to carry forward you know, American ideas of, 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 of freedom and so on. But artists like Lawrence were most interested in, in um, investigating you know, the connection between you know, their own you know, cultural heritage um, as, Af you know, as black people in the United States and the opportunity they had uh, during this period to work in places like Nigeria or to develop a network in this context. And of course, the seventh chapter 
um, nations seeking form, very much concerned with uh, the project of decolonization and the way decolonization, you know, um, you know, featured, um, but also in the work of the artists, but at the same time, looking at, you know, development of reconstruction of national territories, you know, after the war, and, you know, the, the work of, you know, Vedova, and of course, you know, Jes Jesper Johns um, with, the, with the flags. The, the, we're interested in this particular work because of the kind of the optical illusion that the work creates when you look at the white dot um, and the black dot. So the, you know, and the way the, the red, white, and blue suddenly appears um, in, you know, in, in the, uh, the, 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 um, the panel underneath. And so you really have to focus on the white dot for, you know, for a little bit and then look at the black dot. Um, so this idea of the instability of this particular symbol within the context of the United States, within the development of, did you? Sorry, we're all staring at the <laughs> yeah, if, you know, if you stare at it long enough, you know, it, it, it actually does work. <laughs> anyway, so uh, why did we include American artists in this section, Nation Seeking Form? Because when we really to think about decolonization or when we discuss the territory of the nation, we are oftentimes more deeply concerned with you know, classical forms of decolonization. And I think, given what has just happened in the United States, um, it's very important to remind ourselves you know, of the, um, you know, the, the very nature of the civil rights struggle in the post-war period and how you know, that struggle was also informed by you know, um, examples of, you know, decolonization from different parts of the world. The way that, you know, African Americans adopted Gandhi's, you know, nonviolent, you know, credo as uh, a way, you know, to, you know, push forward the emancipation of the, um, uh, of the you know, of, of the black, you know, population. So we're very interested in the way in which you know, artists sort of dealt with the with the with the symbols, with the imagery, with the um, with the you know the the the, uh, the deconstruction of of the you know you know national um, you know imaginaries, and of course the way in which they work with you know, the, for example, with Larry Rivers, this juxtaposition between you know uh, of the Confederate you know flag. And the, and, the, and the American flag. So, um, and then to look at the fact that in the post-war period, um, this was a, a moment of incredible, you know, not only instability, the exchange of national territories, the exchange of national boundaries between, uh, you know, different, you know, in, in, in between different, you know, national, uh, you know, you know, spaces. The creation of Israel in 1948, and of course the partition of the of Palestine, um, in the work of you know the African American artists like Jack Whitten, you know looking at you know the civil rights movement, um, you know with, you know Selma, you know Birmingham, uh, the the, um, the Melvin Edwards uh, Lynch fragments, you know. Um, uh, examining the kind of the brutality of lynching in the United States, and of course, um, the Europeans, you know, who, who were resettled in in, um, in in Israel after the war, um, you know, the migration um, of populations to to feel and to you know, consolidate these, you know, uh, new national, you know, frontiers. And of course, in the case of, of African artists, the undoing of 
the or the attempt to to sort of to undo the inherited colonial you know symbols whether it's religion uh, or the um, the use of uh, African symbols as a way to sort of to reclaim, um, you know, c forms of cultural authenticity or resistant structures um, um, against colonialism or individual artists' own relationship to the state. Here in the context of India Flatoon, a series of works she made while she was imprisoned by Nasser. She was a communist artist and spent um, um, about you know five years in jail, and and but had um, access to you know to art material while she was in prison, making you know you know some of these works. Um, here, the work of um, an Australian Aboriginal artist um, during the beginnings of the attempt to lay claim to land uh, in Australia with this very historical petition, you know, signed, you know, made on a bark, um, you know, support, um, you know, by uh, communities uh, of uh, Aboriginal communities in Australia. So Sydney from the air, you know, um, in a sense is a, uh, a, an attempt to sort of to survey this, um, you know, territory, this colonized territory and, uh, um, and of course, um, you know, here um, in the specific context of France with Algeria and with you know, the referendum. And you know, the last section, I'm just going to you know, go through the images really, you know, um, um, quickly then, you know. where you know, the uh, popular media, popular culture, the, um, the um, uh, um, technology you know, began to play a, a very strong role uh, in the work of artists. Um, so, you know, post-war, um, <coughs> Now, as I mentioned, it was an opportunity, um, you know, through this research, you know, to create an exhibition um, that was not about rewriting art history, but about expanding the territory of the understanding of what um, artists had done across different you know, artistic frontiers and to ask the question whether it is possible to reconsider both within the writing of art historical narratives and in museum collections, these missing narratives, what would it mean to um, expand um, our considerations of um, you know, post-war artistic production if we include you know, the work of artists who operated um, in a very considered um, uh, and serious manner um, you know, in their particular context. Of course, I'm not talking about Yoko Ono, but you know, you know, because uh, obviously, you know, she's a very well-known figure. So, what would that really mean? So, that was the uh, the whole idea of this exhibition. And I should, you know, say though um, that the what we um, learned from the exhibition um, is the impossibility. Um, of uh, organizing an exhibition um, using the same kind of filters that you know, have been um, deployed in the 
various examples uh, that have been attempted in the past. And what was also very clear was, you know, which surprised us that such an exhibition had not necessarily been made. We have examples of Magicien de la Terre, we have examples of, um, of Westkunst, but it was really very surprising that, the, 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 that on the global level, this particular period had not been looked at, that the manifestations of you know, the so-called you know, global or, you know, art um, have only been attempted within the art that were you know, made in the 90s to this period. So um, this particular you know, period demands you know, very you know, scrupulous you know, examination um, but also, it's also very clear that that examination requires a great deal of work to be able to unpack. What has made it possible today is the emergence of what we could call not a global art history, but regional art histories, where very specific parts of the world are now beginning to do very detailed research into their own modern and contemporary art heritage. So if you look at collections in Sharjah or in Doha, in, in Cairo, um, uh, even in Nigeria, in Brazil, in Argentina, uh, in India, that it's only through expanding our network of research would we be able to bring you know, together um, um, this kind of works. It's not possible for museums today to construct um, a collection, you know, that have um, many of these works that which have now disappeared in very, um, uh, into, uh, you know, private collections or very specific state collections. Not in, it's not possible. So this could only really be done through exhibitions. Of course, there are many attempts by museums today. The Catherine's, you know, research in the exhibition plural, you know, modernity at at um, at, 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 at Pompidou, um, you know, was um, a, a very important, you know, shift, um, you know, to begin, you know, helping us think uh, uh, about the, the the ways in which we can make you know, such exhibitions. So thank you. Sorry. Sorry that my, 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 my thoughts were a bit fragmented. I brought a paper. I thought I would show images and then read a little bit of my paper, but that was not possible. Uh, but I hope, you know, by bombarding you with lots of images that we are able to sort of, you know, to see um, um, our general endeavor and, and, and where, you know, that brought us in the exhibition. Well, thank you very much, Oakley. I think everybody has uh, understood that uh, there are eight sections, and each section is like a complete show by itself. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and so we have had a conference on eight shows, and uh, I would strongly recommend to uh, everybody who can go there to go and see the show because uh, it's so interesting. Uh, to, to see the works, to see all these works, and to reconsider on that period with that very large problem. And uh, I think this is something very unusual that you have done. It's based on years of research, and we can see it through the exhibition, all of the exhibition, and we discover things, but it's not only the question of discovery. We remind things. Uh, that we knew but had forgotten or have neglected. And I think it, it would be uh, very interesting, mostly for French people, because several of these artists used to live in Paris, and we have forgotten them. And uh, an artist like Giacometti was not a French artist, and even this uh, we tend to forget, uh, actually. <laughs> and uh, Giacometti, if we uh, think in terms of history of art and making the history of art of the post war in France, we would say, oh, he was very famous artist in France. He was not. He was very famous artist in the United States. 
and he had his first show in France after he died. So it's very interesting for me. I'm really fascinated by the history of art because uh, there are several um, ways to, to go to the history of art and to consider uh, the different periods. And I think that the historical way, which is not a way which uh, really avoids the question of aesthetics, not at all, but that integrates some other questions, other issues like uh, history, like politics, like social issues, uh, like linked with all the kind of art and literature extra is very, very important. And thank you very much, Oakley, because you have done this in a very big, big project. And uh, I hope I will see the next one and the third one. <laughs> 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 <Because> it's <laughs> if I survive, if I survive the renovation, <laughs> if I survive the renovation, then there will be a third one. <laughs> well, thank you, Catherine. Uh, Catherine. Um, it, 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 my, you know, entire work as a curator, you know, has been always um, devoted to implicating, you know, different territories of practice in my exhibition, um, and you know, so the, the the question, you know, for this show. Um, it, it, was not so much how do we historicize these artists uh, or what kind of consideration can we bring you know to um, you know looking at you know developments that at first glance might you know strike us on the one hand as you know uh, belated you know this is a term that we have to grapple with derivative which is another term, you know, the, 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 the absence of originality. Um, and, 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 and these are, you know, terms, you know, that are in a sense very loaded in the, um, um, you know, whenever one brings together, you know, uh, very highly recognized, you know, artists, um, you know, from, um, Context that, in a sense, you know, have very advanced institutions of art, and artists who come from contexts that do not have very advanced institutions. So the the, the question of of um, of influence, you know, it, it, you know, becomes in a sense also paramount when we bring some of these artists together because the, you know. Who is learning from who, and who is, um, you know, um, being experimental uh, in the, uh, you know, kind of um, way in which we think about experimentation. So when you look at artists, African artists, for example, the tendency will be to sort of to look at their work and and see very little experimentation, especially within the context of the modern and contemporary African art. Uh, but what we tend to forget, in, uh, you know, for example, is um, the, the layers of experimentation um, that, are, you know, uh, that have occurred you know, within the history of art in Africa. So I'll give one very simple, you know, example because it's, it's very interesting to go to the Giacometti Picasso show today and, you know, to see some of the things that Picasso collected um, in, the, in, the, um, in the museum. Uh, and, and to sort of to imagine the, about the reception of African art in European art. And one of the things, I think that the general narrative is this confrontation with the primitive. But what is very clear is that African art pre the 17th century was very naturalistic and realistic. You know, if you look at Benin bronzes, if you look at Ife art from the, you know, you know from the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, you know, you know, the records are there. Then, then come late 17th century, this shift to 
abstraction. We have not studied this rupture in the language of African art. And so I was reminded of this being in a museum of Picasso today and seeing this flat you know, mask you know, from, from Mali, kind of like a, uh, that Picasso collected. And there's just, there's just nothing like it. It's, it's just uh, an incredible you know, you know, you know, you know, piece of carving uh, you know, from a single piece of wood. And, and it reminded me that if this artist can be in the same space, why is it so difficult for contemporary or modern art, art, you know, African artists to be in the same space with Western artists? So these questions have to be tackled not only just simply looking at the present, but to look at the arc of experimentation um, that has occurred in various cultural contexts. Because it's only then that one can begin to understand the, the shifts that African artists or, or Asian or whatever have made you know, within the context of inherited forms that they've, you know, that did they develop out of. So it's very, you know, striking to sort of to think about um, in, in the context of, of, of the post-war, um, the way that the academic training of some of these artists um, informed other kinds of artistic thinking when those artists brought that language back to their particular part of the world. Um, Especially when we look at the Indian artists like Magbu, Fida Hussein, you know the um, the references to temple, you know paintings in the work, um, you know sort of create again a completely you know different gene genealogy. So um, so I'm very much interested in how exhibitions can you know enable us you know bring into you know, discussion, you know, some of these developments in the work of, of artists from, you know, other parts of the world. So thank you again, Louis, and I'll uh, see you soon. Uh, I hope we will see you in France. Yeah. And Simon, I hope you will come for one of our next conferences. Um, and uh, yes, and we will first read all your catalog from the beginning to the end, <laughs> and, and second, uh, I hope to, to see you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.